morning, church. Yeah, give some praise to God for showing up. Amen. Man, I, my name is Patrick. You saw me a second ago. Um, I am new here on the Real Life staff. And um, Pastor gave me the honor of getting to share a word with you this morning. Um, but before I jump into it, I want to give you a little bit of history. History is maybe not the right word. Just to let you know who I am just a little bit. Um, my wife and I, and if you don't know that beautiful woman singing that last song, Heather is my wife. And um, yeah. <laughs> We've been in this community about eight years. Um, I've been a youth and worship pastor um, somewhere around 18, 15 to 18 years. And it's just been my, my whole life. And uh, we served on staff at another um, church here in town. And how many of you have been surprised by the last year and a half? Like a lot of stuff changed in your life, in you. Every single part of my life on the outside changed. Um, God began to move us about two years ago, move our hearts. We just weren't content. Um, there was just more that he wanted for us. And, and he began to, to move us away. And um, the last about six months, I've had the privilege of getting to know our pastor. And uh, I don't know if you realize just what an amazing privilege it is to have a pastor like Vince. Um, amen. <laughs> But what he has done in me and in my family has absolutely been unforeseen. Um, just speaking into us and encouraging us and, and lifting us up. And uh, so I get to be a part of this church, this staff, and um, I'm over teaching and development. And so if you get to go through the internship or you get to do life groups or, or anything like that, my hand's going to be on it. And I'm so excited for that. Um, getting to lead and grow. And uh, before we get going too far, I, I want to introduce my, my family. Um, Heather, obviously, you saw her. Those beautiful kids, 100% hers. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's my oldest, uh, Addison Grace. Um, she will lead this world soon. Um, Ella, Ella Rose is six, and Hudson Hawk is our little ball of laugh and mischief. And uh, he just turned two. And uh, so that's my family. You will see them running around, I'm sure, after um, service, in between services, um, because they're pastor's kids and they do weird stuff. That's just what they do. Um, when pastor came to me talking about, um, well, he didn't start with me, but when we started planning the summer, the summer of 10, he decided he wanted to do kind of a hall of fame of sermons. So he went back over the last 10 years and picked some that really impacted people that had a big movement or people really got behind or really spoke to them. And um, a couple of weeks before that, God had began laying this, um, this book of the Bible on my heart. And I was kind of um, wrestling with it. I'd even talked to him about it. There was some stuff that jumped off the page to me for the first time ever. And so when he was laying it out, um, the sermon Game Changer and the book that I had been kind of digging into seemed to be a good match. Well, I went back and I watched a couple of his, his messages in the series Game Changer. And one of those, the three points in which he talked about were the excuses and why we don't do what God's asking us to do. Fit so perfectly the chapter that God had already laid on my heart that I'm actually going to steal those three points. Um, but we're not going to be talking about David and Goliath like he did. Um, and as I was kind of preparing for that and Game Changer, um, there's kind of a sports theme associated with it. And, and I remembered having this jersey in the back of my closet. It's a 2010 World Series jersey, Josh Hamilton. How many of you have any idea who Josh Hamilton is? About 12 of you. 
which is totally okay. So in 2001, Josh Hamilton was drafted number one overall in Major League Baseball. And within about a year, he was in a car accident with him and his parents, and they were all injured. And it began this cycle with Josh of substance abuse to the point where he had actually gotten kicked out of the league. Um, he spiraled in a crazy way. He started failing tests left and right. He was in a unknown minor league, um, just trying to earn his way back. And he met a guy um, who actually ended up becoming his father-in-law. And that guy led him to Christ. And his whole life began to change in about 2005, 2006. And this journey of him being, number one, overall, he obviously has talent. But his talent wasn't enough. He had to deal with some stuff in his soul, and Christ started doing that in his life in 2005, 2006. So and we fast forward to the World Series um, 2010 um, year. Something that only, the reason why, I, how many of you know that World Series? How many of you, let me back up one second, how many of you are Cardinals fans? Wow, only seven of you too? So, <laughs> like, you don't know who Josh Hamilton is. I think the same people raise their hand. Like, so you're a Cardinals fan and you know who Josh Hamilton is. The rest of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's y'all? The rest of y'all? Okay. So um, he had this amazing um, home run in late, I think it was game five, six in the World Series, um, which won on the game, set him up to win it. And how many of you know how that World Series turned out? Yeah. Um, the, Car the Cardinals actually pulled off the last two games to come back and win that series. So congratulations to those guys, jerks. But um, <laughs> why I brought up Josh Hamilton, why I'm wearing this jersey, was earlier in that year, he became one of only six players in the history of the league to be walked with bases loaded. And on the end... Uh, the post-game interview with the opposing manager, um, the score was two to five, I believe. And um, the manager said, Josh Hamilton has hit 26 home runs. The next guy's hitting four. I'm not giving him a chance to win this game. They walked him, gave up a run, and they actually, the manager won because they walked Hamilton. But the idea of a individual player in baseball being such a game changer that they gave up an intentional run just so he didn't get to swing the bat. That is what we're talking about. A moment that changes everything, a game changing moment. And so we're gonna actually talk about a story that I would venture to say almost all of you've heard but you don't know much about. How many of you know the story of Jonah? Okay, most of you, way more than seven. That's good, at least we're, at least we're getting somewhere. Um, I actually, two days ago, saw a news article. Do y'all know what I'm talking about yet? Yep. A dude got eaten by a whale the other day and lived. Like, how many times in history has that happened? Like, Jonah, and then a random crab fisherman in I don't even remember where he was from. But it came across my news feed two days ago. And I was like, well, okay, Lord, that's funny. So apparently it was a whale, not just a big fish. Um, that's a debate if you don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, within the staff, we went in circles a few times about that one. Um, but how many of you, that's all the story you know. Jonah, big fish, whale, and lived. That's all you got. Be honest. That's all you got of the story. Most of us live there. Um, I almost provided complimentary coloring books for those of you who needed it. Um, I actually printed off a couple, decided it was probably counterproductive. And so we're going to jump into Jonah. We're going to cover the entire book of Jonah. So if you will allow me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story quite a bit because we, it would be pretty boring if I just read four chapters. It's short. But there's going to be some times I have to kind of summarize what went on. So I encourage you to go back and read it for yourself. But Jonah 1. And the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it 
because I've seen how wicked its people are. So Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction. How many of you know that when you go the opposite direction of what God's asking you to do, it doesn't turn out like you expect it to turn out? Right? And so he went down to the port of Joppa and found a ship leaving Tarsus, and he bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape the Lord by sailing to Tarsus. Uh, that doesn't work out. We know that. But here's our first excuse. So often, when God's telling us to do something, we pray about it. Now, how many of you have heard pastors say something like this? Um, if someone comes up to you or you're talking to someone and they give you a prayer request or something going on in your life and you say, I'll pray about it, and in that moment you don't grab them by the shoulder and pray about it, you might as well have kept your mouth shut. Anybody heard that? Right? That is one of my pet peeves. Like if, if you're going through something and I tell you I'm going to pray about it and then I walk left, oh, dear Lord, strike me down. Like that, that is not what we should do ever. Now, that's actually not what I'm talking about. Because that's a person-to-person -person inter interchangement. What we're talking about is a God-to-self exchange. So if God's asking you to do something, He sets something in your path, or He's encouraged you, encourage, I don't know how often God encourages us to make decisions. If God's telling you to do something, and you let Him know, I'm going to have to pray about that. Um... We're taking this first step a little bit wrong. We often show up to God with a pros and cons list, like when he says you need to do this thing, and we're like, yeah, but it doesn't fit in my finances. Like, I'm actually really busy today. I have a lunch scheduled with so-and-so, and we're going to Rio, and I just can't give that up. Um, when we show up to God with our pros and cons list, we've missed the point. But why this fits so well is because we often neglect digging into the Word. Because if God's asking you to do something, and the thing He's asking you to do is directly found in Scripture, guess what you don't have to do? If God has a directive in His Word telling you to take a step because He's asking you to love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, Be the hands and feet of Christ. Talk to your neighbor about your salvation. Have love, joy, peace in your life. Patience. Oh. If God's telling you to do something, and it's found in Scripture, you don't have this luxury. Now, I'm going to take a half step back. Sometimes it takes some prayer to figure out what God is actually saying to you. Sometimes it takes some digging into the Word to go, yes, it is in there. That is what God's asking me to do. Okay? Take those steps. But do not use this as an excuse of why you're not doing what God's asking you to do. There are so many times that we hear God say something to us, and then our next step, the very next step, is to talk to absolutely anyone who will possibly listen to us about what we feel like God's doing because we're hoping that they give us some negative feedback and that's going to give us a little bit of ammunition to tell God, well, but Joe said that was a bad idea. <laughs> and so then we'll just, I'm going to take a step back, God, and I'm going to pray about it a little longer because i got a red flag over here. Now, I'm not saying don't seek godly counsel. You should absolutely seek godly counsel, but that circle should be pretty small. I am very guilty of that. Because um, I like to talk. And so I'm on a wise counsel about 40 people and be like, so God's doing this thing in me, and I feel like he said take this really bold step, and it's a pretty bold, scary step, and I don't really want to do it. So how about you give me some feedback, not mic feedback, that was interesting. But will you give me some feedback that will give me some ammunition to tell God I, I, I'm not quite ready to make this step? We have got to quit using prayer as a negotiation. We have got to quit using prayer as an excuse to stall. 
If God is speaking to you and you know he's speaking to you, if that directive is found in his word, the only thing left is to take a step. Delayed obedience is disobedience. If God is saying go, go. Is that good? All right. Let's move on. 1 verse 4. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to come back to that. For help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten up the ship. This surprises me. But the, all the time, Jonah is sound asleep down in the hold. He ran away from God as far as he possibly could to the bottom of the boat and managed to fall asleep. Not only was he trying to run physically from God, he wanted to turn off mentally from what God was doing. He was as far removed as possible. Here's excuse number two. Procrastination. How many of you would call yourself, when it comes to schoolwork, a procrastination? A procrastinator. Work, a procrastinator. Lawn care. Like, I've got animals back there I didn't know I have, right? Like that type of procrastination. That's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is delaying what God wants to do through you because you're hoping someone else steps in and takes it from you. We all... I'm, I think all will suffice. Have friends or family who are just like those sailors. They're crying out to the gods of this world, trying to find hope, trying to find peace, trying to find purpose. And they're seeking jobs. They're seeking relationships that are toxic. They're seeking substances that are destroying them. They're seeking toys and entertainment. They're seeking all these things that the world says are going to fulfill them, and we're watching back, sitting back watching it just unravel. How many of you know storms don't reside on their own? When those friends and family are desperately seeking for some kind of salvation, and we're sitting back because it's going to be a hard conversation, they may not, they may not hear us. They may not like us after the fact, but we're okay with them drowning, being overwhelmed by life. We don't always know how to say all the right words in these situations. And I know oftentimes that creates such a fear in us that we just do nothing. I want to present the idea that And where we're about to go, you'll see it. But if God's calling you to it, if he's calling you and you feel it, if he's calling you to a conversation, expect him to already be there. He's already laid the groundwork for what that person's needing to hear. He's already working on their heart. Now, in that moment, they may push against it. In that moment, they may not want to hear what you have to say. But we have to be willing to take that step. We have to be willing to set our comfort aside to reach one more. One of the values in this house, and I absolutely love it, is we're called to reach one more soul, one more family, and one more community. And I don't know how many of us really own that. Like in your soul, do you own that? In your heart, are you confident enough to risk something to reach one more? Yes. Especially when it comes to friends and family. Now, I know personally full well what it feels like to have someone in your family lost or a friend who, who you desperately want them to catch it. You desperately want them to hear the gospel. You desperately want their life to change because you see the tension and the turmoil and the brokenness. But how often... Are we just content sitting back and hoping they come to us? Hoping that they break down the barrier. Hoping that they all of a sudden have boldness. When we're sitting there with Christ living in us going, that's the one. Just take the step. They need to know what you have inside of you. 
Be bold because their soul matters, their family matters. So step out in faith. Trust that God's going to precede that conversation. And he'll meet you there and speak through you. So as I get ready to jump into uh, the third excuse, there's a lot of scripture I need to cover before we get there to set it up. So um, I'm going to kind of summarize the, uh, the next couple of chapters, if that's okay. I'm going to pull a couple of scriptures out of there, but I encourage you to go read this on your own. It's a great, great story. <laughs> All right, so the rest of that chapter, the rest of chapter one is actually um, pretty interesting. The, the boat's going crazy. The captain goes down and pulls Jonah up out of his sleep. And in, chap- in verse 12, Jonah actually admits it's his fault. He knows full well that we're about to die. The storm's about to kill us all because I'm running from God. And the captain and the crew are like, what's wrong with you? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, you are running from God. You know this storm's your fault and you're sleeping. And there's this cool back and forth that Jonah admits it's his fault. And then he says, just throw me, just throw me into the ocean. Have any of you ever been on like a lake when it gets like really windy? Like just a lake? I've, I've never really been in deep water like the ocean when it goes crazy. But I can only imagine the idea of throwing him into the ocean. He's dead. Like, there's no coming back from that. So Jonah asked the captain and the crew to throw him in the water. Basically, y'all kill me. And they go back and forth. They're like, heck no. If your God's the one causing this storm, we're not killing you. Like, that's not, we're not putting that on. I'm not taking that on. They go back and forth. They even try to row it out. They get the rows out, and they're like, it can't gain any ground. So eventually, they concede. They're like, okay, um, the God who's controlling all of this, please have mercy on us, Jonah. The moment Jonah hits the water, it says immediately the storm ceased. They all, in that moment, realized we just spent the last bunch of hours trying to figure out why our gods are causing this storm, and apparently we picked the wrong one. It says that they all came to the Lord in that moment, right? They throw him into the water and insert whale. Jonah gets eaten. He spends the next three days in the belly of that well. How many of you know that's a game changer? Like, regardless of what's going on. So that story, that article that I read said he was down there getting his crabs and he was swimming. He felt a bump and it all went black. Like, oh, what just happened? And he said it wasn't until the tongue pressed up against him that he knew what had happened. <laughs> what a exchange that must have been. But Jonah spent three days in there. And so chapter two is Jonah praying this out. Like, okay, Lord, I thought they'd just kill me. But apparently you wanted to make this way different. And so he's hanging out in the belly of this well, and he begins to pray, and he records this prayer. And so we're going to jump in, and we're actually going to grab this. Um, This is at the end of that prayer, and he says, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Salvation belongs to you, to the Lord. That That change from, I'm intentionally going down to the dock. I'm intentionally buying a ticket. I'm intentionally getting on this boat, running from the Lord. I'm going to go take a nap, running from the Lord, to salvation belongs to you. I tried to run. It didn't work out. God, you're way bigger than I thought. And so I am going to repent, right? This heart change that happens in Jonah is really neat to see. Chapter 3, verse 1, the fish, the whale, spits him out, and we see the heart change. This time, Jonah obeyed, right? Because he realized he didn't have a choice. 
Um, if he's going to send a storm and eat me by, with a well and deliver me to Nineveh, I guess we're going to do what you say, Lord. Um, the Lord's command, and he went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. Do you realize what that actually means? This city was massive. When I read that, it was the, a couple of weeks ago, it was the first time I'd actually read that it was that big. Three days to walk. Do you know if you started walking right now, you're almost to Fayetteville in three days? So a city large enough from here to Fayetteville is insanely large. We're talking a population of hundreds of thousands of people spread out over a massive area. And what we see in chapter 3 is that Jonah shows up and says, Hey, y'all, uh, fish ate me. I'm back. And uh, God says he's going to kill y'all all because you're sinners. There's a crazy moment that happens. Now, we can't see any previous history between Jonah and Nineveh. There's, there's no explanation of what that may have been or not been. But we know that in those words, the entire massive city repented. And not just the people repented, it got to the king. The king stepped down off his throne in verse 6. He stepped down and took his robe off and repented in not just words, but in actions. He sent out decrees that everything in his kingdom would observe a season of mourning, even down to the cattle were not allowed to eat. What a crazy transformation, right? That Jonah shows up to a hard conversation. God says you're wicked. He's going to destroy you. And they're like, well, we don't want that. And the whole place transforms. The whole place turns to God. Like what a crazy moment of God showing up and preparing the way and being ahead of what even Jonah had to say. See, Nineveh was actually the capital of the Assyrian nation. The Assyrians were known as ruthless, as brutal. Um, in Nahum, they actually describe the Assyrian nation as lions, ripping apart nations. They were known to rip the skin off of their captives. They were just brutal. They wanted to capture everything, own everything. They wanted to be the man. Babylonians, Romans, right? They're that. They were just huge and violent. But they had a moment with God that transformed an entire nation. And it brings us to point number three. The excuse. But first we're going to jump to this scripture. Chapter 4, verse 2. And this is Jonah. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were merciful and compassionate God. Slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love, you are eager to turn your back from destroying people. What you're seeing is what we thought happened in that well was a heart change. It wasn't. Jonah didn't have a heart change. It was reluctant surrender. I obviously can't run away from you anymore, God. What we see in chapter 4 is Jonah angry with God for showing up because he wanted Nineveh destroyed. He wanted the judgment to fall on those sinners. He wanted it wiped off the face of the earth so that he could go, see, you act bad, God gets you. But I knew that you were going to do this, God. He spends the rest of the chapter basically telling God to, to take him out. If this is how you're going to be, God, I don't want to be a part of it. See, Jonah had all the history. He was a prophet, so therefore he spent his whole life probably pursuing God. He knew all the theology. He had been to all the Bible studies. He had been to all the worship services. He had spoke to other people. 
And yet, he just didn't want to do it. He didn't want any part of God redeeming that nation. He completely missed what God did because of his prejudice, because of the things he thought they deserved. See, God showed up and radically transformed an entire, an entire nation, including the guy who was in charge of it all. And Jonah was mad. He was angry. And I wonder how many of us live right there. We come in here and we see people walk to the front. And we see people walking in the parking lot. I'm like, I know that one. I know where they were. Man, I grew up with that kid. I saw their name in the paper the other day. Oh, I saw that bumper sticker. I know how they voted. And we judge someone's redemptive value in an instant. Do we really own that we want to see God transform this community because we're driving and we see a bumper sticker and we instantly think we know everything about them? We see the way they look and we instantly judge whether they're allowed to have God transform their life or not. We are so quick to forget the mercy that God's shown us. Just like Jonah. Jonah got to watch it happen. And minutes later, days later, going, I thought you were going to give them what they deserved. I thought that you were going to show up and be righteous anger and show them that you can't act that way. But instead, that's why I tried to run, because I knew you were going to do it, because you're loving and you're merciful and you're full of grace and compassion and patience. Like you were, like he was with Jonah, like he is with me, like he is with you. But then we look at someone else and we go, that one's not worth it. We've got, we've got to realize that there's some stuff in us sometimes that shouldn't be there. Sometimes there's some judgment in us, there's some self-righteousness in us that causes us to think we're better. And in reality, maybe our sin's different. Maybe our past is better or different. But we have got to get to a place in us where it doesn't matter what you look like when you walk through that door and it doesn't matter what you look like when you're sitting in that restaurant it doesn't matter what you look like when you're walking down the street that we see you as Christ sees you we see them as Christ sees them where we're so broken by the fact that they may not know Jesus that I don't even care what the barrier is between me and you I'm going to walk it we have got to get to a place where our hearts break for those who are breaking. And in Matthew, Jesus says this, the people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. A vile, violent, angry, conquering nation is transformed by the love of God. Imagine what He can do through you. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have walked through grace and forgiveness and you live in that in this moment. How are we not open-handed about that? It's so easy for us to forget that without the love of God, without the grace that He has shown us, any failure is possible. Any sin is possible.